that's on, and this is on. Okay. Hello, man. Mm -hmm. Watch this chapter three. Brother, you want to open us in a word of prayer, please? Father, thank you for this morning. We can rise and give thanks to you. I pray that we do this that, and I pray that you give us your Holy Spirit's understanding and wisdom, direction, application in your word, and I pray that you can hide it in our hearts. Mm -hmm. We walk in it. Bless this church service. God, speak through Pastor Jerry, speak through me. Transformational turning point of Romans 12, 1 through 3. Uh, it is literally a wonderful work of God. Um, it is like turning a tadpole into a frog. Uh, it's, it's putting off the old man, putting on the new man, and be, not being conformed to this world. Not having any desire to be conformed to this world once you put on the new man. Uh, but to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. When I woke up this morning and went into my study and I, I sat there looking at this book, uh, I put my hands on this book and just in awe that I could open this book and knowing this was the mind and the heart of God. And my desire, my hunger, uh, my, my request to my Lord was that he would renew the spirit of my mind afresh and anew. I, I never want to come to this book thinking, I, well, I've got it. Yeah, I pretty much know what it says. <laughs> I want to come to this book hungering and thirsting, amen, and, and seeking God's face and seeking God's truth. Uh, and in particular about the study that we've been involved in for the last several weeks, uh, the beauty of our Romans 12, 1 and 2 if we present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy. The moment we present our bodies holy and acceptable unto God, uh, which is our reasonable service, the very moment this provides us an immediate enabling. Because what we're doing is we're presenting our bodies a living sacrifice. We're crucifying the old man. We're putting on a new man. At that very moment that you pray that and that you talk to the Lord about that, uh, and that this uh, takes place in your life, God gives you an, an, an immediate enabling. In other words, what he does is he, he, uh, he does this through the grace of God. The moment you have confessed your sins, you put off the old man and put on the new man, you've got it. The grace is available for you to perform um, well, what God says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, be not conformed to this world. The grace is available for you to do that, amen? Uh, and that you might be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The grace is available for this transformation at the very moment that you present your body in the living. That, that excites me, and, and I love that passage. But what I want us to think about is if we put off the old man and put on the new, 
if we choose not to be conformed to the image of this world, I want you to understand what you're choosing is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 29, that was predestinated before the foundation of the world, that we would be conformed to the what? To the image of Jesus Christ. And I was thinking about this morning about the difference in the image we bear when we are conformed to the world and the image that we bear when we are conformed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, I said we were interweaved, Galatians 2, 20. Unless we have put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and unless he is living his resurrection life through us, there is no way we'll ever be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Unless he is living his resurrection life through us. And so that sounds basic, but the average Christian doesn't really understand that. What I want to focus on this morning, just for a few moments, is I want us to think about that image. What are we talking about when we talk about being conformed to the image of Christ? Or being conformed to the image of this world? Well, you know, in order to determine that, I want to give you a definition of the word image. I want it to be perfectly clear in your mind. And the, the most simple definition of the word image is a likeness or resemblance. That, that's the simplest root definition of the word image. But let's go a little deeper than that. But the way God is speaking of the word image here is it is a representation it's more than just a likeness or a resemblance. It has somebody in mind, and that somebody is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? When we talk about being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. It is a representation in me of the person, Jesus Christ. You could almost say it's an imitation of the Lord Jesus Christ in my life. I'm imitating the Lord Jesus Christ in my speech. I'm imitating the Lord Jesus Christ in my actions, my conduct, my behavior. But most of all, in my character. Because I'm imitating the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the idea of the word image. Uh, it, it means to be and act the same as. Wow, well, to be and to act the same as. Which, well, Brother Patrick, I see how I can act the same as, but to be the same as? Yeah, that, that's the beauty of Galatians 2.20. You can be the same as Jesus Christ. When you put off the old man, put on the new, you put on the Lord Jesus Christ, according to Romans 13, 14. Amen? And not only that, when you, when, well, the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ, what? Liveth in me. And I am a, I'm going to be very serious with you. What God wants from us is a perfect imitation of His Son, Jesus Christ. He wants a perfect representation of His Son, Jesus Christ. Can you see that? That's, that's my father's goal. That's, that delights my father to see that in me. And you know why that excites me? Because I've come to the point in my life where when I wake up in the mornings, my greatest desire, when I start my day, I, it's a plan, it's a goal, is, is today I want to bring God all the possible pleasure from my life and existence that a man can possibly bring me. Now I may fail, <laughs> but it's not because I wasn't pursuing it. It wasn't, it's not because that wasn't my heartbeat. I'm going to, by the, by the grace of God in me and the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ in me, I'm going to guard every word that comes out of my mouth. Amen? My conversation. I'm going to, folks, I'm going to be very careful. Now, please listen to me. I'm going to be very careful in the way I present myself to other people in every way. And I know this bugs people to death, but including the way I dress. Amen? 
I am a royal priest. I, folks, I take this serious. I am a royal priest of God. I'm a joint heir of Jesus Christ. I want to be a perfect representation of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to honor him in everything I do, everything I say, how I act, where I go, how I dress. Amen. I don't want anything to detract from my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's an important aspect. Uh, here was a definition I like that I really like. Reproduce in form or manner. God, hey, that's a good definition. Reproduce. That's what I want. I want to be reproduced. I need to be reproduced. Well, I do that when I put off the old man and put on the new. I reproduce in what? In form or manner. And I want to just, because that word manner, I, I mean, I looked it up this morning, and it's just amazing how many times in the Bible the word manner or manners is used in the Bible. I'm not even doing that. What does that mean? What does it really mean? I can say reproduced in form or manner, but I want, let's go deeper. What does it mean? And so I looked it up. And, and the basic definition was customary behavior. Mm -hmm. That's their manner. That's just their manner, we say. That's their customary behavior. So, to be reproduced in form or manner. I want to be re reproduced in the, in the manner of Jesus Christ. His customary behavior. I want to be my customary behavior. Amen? Mm -hmm. And then another definition. Habitual fashion. I thought that was interesting. Habitual fashion that reflects moral. Let me say it correctly. Habitual fashion that reflects moral standards or moral bearing. Habitual fashion. Form. And that goes anything from, from the way you dress to the way you act, any manner in which you conduct yourself. And so uh, it's repro being reproduced in form or manner, and that's what God wants. Then the final one, I like this one. I like this. Uh, it, the spiritual definition is to reflect the character of Jesus Christ. There it is, right there in a the nutshell. And folks, the way you're going to reflect, this is how walking in the Spirit ties in many ways. This is the primary way that walking in the Spirit ties into the crucified resurrection life. The ninefold fruit of the Spirit are the, is, are the, they are the ninefold reflections of the image of Jesus Christ. If you can get those nine, that ninefold fruit of the Spirit perking and working in your life. And you know what? The great thing is, it's a work of God. Because He will produce it in you as long as you will allow Him to produce in you a contrite and humble spirit. Because obedience always, in the Old Testament and New Testament, it's a principle. Obedience always follows humility. So if, if you let God produce in you that contrite and humble spirit, He can produce the character of the Lord Jesus Christ and reflect the character of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. So what does Romans 12 2 say? And be not conformed to this world. How does that apply to the world? Very simple. <coughs> Do not bear the image of the world. And I could go into a lot of things, but you know what? You've got the Holy Spirit living within you, and he's a better preacher and teacher than I am. You let him examine your life, every aspect of your life, and look and see if you're being conformed and reproduced in the image of the world or in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just let the Holy Spirit tell you. He'll tell you if you want to hear it. Amen. Now, let me talk with you for a moment about reflecting the character of Christ, because I think that's the best definition. Reflecting the character of Christ. Now, the best way for me to talk to you about reflecting the character of the Lord Jesus Christ is to describe to you what I think character is. So you'll have a good, clear understanding of what we're talking about when we're talking about character. So I'm going to give you a definition of that. Aren't you excited? <laughs> but reflecting the character of Christ, here it is. Character is defined this way. Essential quality 
or qualities of one's nature. Essential means not optional. It means it's, at, it's absolutely got to be a part of you if you're going to call yourself a Christian. That's what it basically boils down to. Is to, have, to have Christ-like character, you've got to have His essential qualities. So essential qualities of one's nature. Now listen, it goes further than that. That determines the degree of excellence one possesses. The essential qualities of one's nature that determines the degree. Now we're talking about in the eyes of God. Yes, be good in the eyes of those around us too, but particularly in the eyes of God. The, the degree of one's excellence that, that one possesses. Because God determines excellence. There's a passage that I, I, I like over in Philippians where he talks about our love. And, and he says, it, and we need to know this because everybody loves to talk about love. And, and just, you know, just love and all. And well, be careful when you hear the religious world and the, world and the world talking about the word love. What they're talking about is laying aside all your standards of excellence that might differ than with theirs. Mm -hmm. And let us all just come together and love one another. I'm sorry, God's not in that. God tells me over in Philippians that his love <laughs> approves things that are excellent. I think, it's in, I think it's in Philippians 2. But I've always used that as a guiding point when I think about loving it. Is be careful because true God's love has boundaries, believe it or not. Loving the way the world loves will get you into some serious problems, serious trouble. It'll change your doctrine. Because see, the religious world says it's not about doctrine, it's about love. So let's just lay aside this thing about, no, you can't do that, amen? You've got to place doctrine where it belongs in the mind and heart of God. You see it in this book right here, how he exalts doctrine. Folks, you can have right doctrine and still love perfectly with the love of Jesus Christ. And in fact, if you love perfectly with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what you'll exhibit? A charitable spirit. That's what we're studying. And so character, essential qualities of one's nature that determines the degree of excellence one possesses. Here's another one. A person's pattern of behavior or personality based upon moral or spiritual strength and moral or spiritual makeup. You might, no, I'm not going to say that. A person's pattern of behavior or personality. So that all this has to do with good character. It has to do with godly character. But it especially has to do with reflecting the character of Jesus Christ in your life. All right, it has a lot to do with, and it's based upon moral or spiritual strength, and makeup, what are we made of this morning? What are you made of this morning? Let's get it personal, amen. What are you made of? Well, is, that is based on choice for those that are in Christ. And the way we choose what we're made of is I think first of all, of course, the blood gate. You got you got to be clean and pure, but you got to choose whether you're going to put on the carnal man and live the carnal life, or put on the new man and live the spiritual life, bearing forth the fruit of the spirit. Amen. Manifesting the character of Jesus Christ. And so, what are we made of? Well, I don't know. That's your choice. And, and here's what could be a sad thing. What we are made of at this very moment is based on the choices we've made up to this point, right? Yeah. Whatsoever ye sow, that shall ye also reap. If you sow to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. Mm -hmm. That principle is a sobering principle to me. God, you're hearing me. You know it is. You know how that affects me every time I think about it. Because when I wake up in the mornings, I know from this moment forward 
everything I do, everything I say, every action and behavior, I'm sowing either to the flesh or to the spirit. Now that could be an awesome thing because I want to sow to the spirit all my waking hours. God has given me principles all over this book that can put set barriers. It keeps me from walking in the flesh. Shows me direction on exactly how to walk in the spirit. I mean, he's filled me with truths that can help me walk a steady order, having my steps ordered in the Lord, walking in the spirit the majority of the day. Amen. It's actually giving me principles that can allow me to do that the whole day, but I don't always obey all those principles like I should. But you see what? This is an exciting life, folks. And yes, we can dwell on the negative that if you choose. To yield your members as, as members of unrighteousness, if you choose not to bring every thought into captivity of the obedience of Christ, if you choose not to let your steps be ordered of the Lord, you sow into the flesh. Mm. And of the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. And folks, what scares me so much about that principle, you've heard it taught, you may sow little, but it, the principle of sowing and reaping, the law of nature, is you'll always reap much. So I want to, folks, I want to sow as very little, little to my flesh. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sow any to it, but I know I'm good. I know I'm going to sow some, okay? But I want to keep that to a very, very bare minimum because of the consequences, because of the, the reaping. We can choose to bear the image and character of Christ. Thank God we can do that. We can choose to bear the image. <laughs> that almost sounds unreal. We can choose to bear the image and the very character of the Lord Jesus Christ by two things. By bearing the fruit of the Spirit, by bearing the fruit of His Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ, while we are living the crucified, resurrection life of Jesus Christ. It's as simple as that. <laughs> Somebody says, simple. <laughs> and you know what? Honestly, I was thinking about this this morning. I thought about it last week and week before. I love the least common denominator. I try to always find the least common. Make it simple for me. Did you know what it all boils down to? It really does. It all boils down to belief or unbelief. If you practice what you say you believe, you can give me some great testimonies of your past week and what God did in your life and, and, and the difference walking in the Spirit made in your life. I mean, you will have testimonies of the presence and the power and, and just the, the personalness and the goodness of God and, and how you walk with Him and you, you actually sense His very presence in your life. Amen? <laughs> Look with me at 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. We're finally getting there. 1 Corinthians 13. Hallelujah. Now, 1 Corinthians 13 is probably one of the most familiar chapters to you as far as the content and subject and all of the Word of God. You know that is the charity chapter. No question, no question about that. <coughs> I'm going to I'm going to call for the sake of study. I'm going to call charity the greatest essential quality of Christ-like character. It manifests him. It manifests who he was. It manifests his mind. His mind was others. His, it manifests his actions, his conduct, his behavior. Everything he did was for somebody. He was constantly pouring out his heart on somebody. He always had his mind on somebody. To love, to help, to meet a need in any way possible. Amen? Amen? But physical sometimes, many times physical. Feeding them. Oh, but so many times spiritual. Mm -hmm. Casting out a stinking devil that he... 
and, and, and of course, obviously, seeing their souls saved, amen, and coming to faith in the Lord Jesus. That's what I want my life to be. God help me. At the end of my week, I want that to, I want that to sum up, didn't I? That's what I want my life to have been, to the glory of God. And if that was my life, it will be to the glory of God. The greatest essential quality of Christ-like character, I'm going to say, is charity. Let me, let me just say that, okay? Look with me now. Uh, in fact, look with me. What did I tell you on the turn this morning? Colossians 3. Colossians 3. Let, let, let me, let's look at it. Verse, I, honestly, I kind of think this may be back set up. Give some spiritual authority to that statement. Colossians chapter 3. Charity, the greatest essential quality of Christ's life, character. In fact, you see, we, don't turn back. But what does the last verse of 1 Corinthians 13 say? Does anybody remember? Faith, hope, and love, these remain. Please help me. These three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is charity. The greatest of these is what? Charity. The greatest of these. Faith, hope, and charity. But God said, God said, the greatest of these is charity. And so when I say the greatest essential quality of Christ-like character is charity, I think I'm not too far off, okay? But now let's look at Colossians chapter 3, and let's see if we get some more validation on that. Colossians chapter 3. And look with me at verse number 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, that's you, that's me, Holy and beloved, thank God that's me and that's you. Holy and beloved of the Lord. So what does he want us to put on? Bowels of mercy, kindness. Now think about Christ now and his character as you read these. Humbleness of mind. Meekness, yes, long suffering. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as, even as Christ, this is how Christ exhibited his character and his love, his charity, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Now listen, verse 14. And above all these things, what does it say? Put on charity. All these things are great. All these things are wonderful. But above Above all these things, put on charity. Charity, the greatest essential quality of the character or Christ-like character. Now, <clears throat> let's look at a phrase there in that verse. And of all these things, put on charity. Now notice this. Which is the what? Which is the bond of perfectness. Wow. Boy, I'd sure like to live that charity in my life. The bond of perfectness. I, I, I started this, like I do so many times, I started to skip over this. And I thought, well, well bond, bond of perfectness. Well, everybody knows pretty much what that means. And I thought, no, no, no. And I don't think I thought it. I think the Holy Spirit said, go slow. That's what he has to tell me so many times. My daughter, Kimberly, if she was here, I'd say, Kimmy, tell them what the, the one saying I had most of your life when you were growing up that irritated the stew out of you. She say, s and &E. I say, tell them what s and &E stands for. Slow and easy. Because she was like her dad. Wired. I'm talking about wired, bouncing off the walls. And so, I don't, I don't know how, when she was old enough to listen, I think, Kimmy, slow and easy. Till she was a teenager, Kimmy, slow and easy. <laughs> Trying to put a gun on her and control her, amen. Um, above all things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Now, here was what I found that was so fascinating. I looked up the word bond. Expecting it to think about our that Yeah, I know it was going to mean something like gluing together or holding together or 
or uh, fascinating together or something like that. But it was more than what I expected. This was the definition I saw when I looked it up in, in Strong's. It is a uniting or controlling principle. I thought, hey, that's good. Charity is the uniting and the and the uh, and the controlling principle. Look at this context. He says, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy. And he names several things. He's, and he says when he gets to verse 14, and above all these things, this is the uniting principle. And all these things I just told you, here's the uniting principle that's going to enable you to do those things. Here is the uniting principle and the controlling principle that's going to enable you to do all these those things. And it's put on charity. The bond of perfection. Alright, so keep that in mind. Now, with that in mind, look with me back at, oh, let's say, look back with me at verse 9 in Colossians 3. <clears throat> Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have, what have you done? That ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. Oh, there it is. After the image of him that created him. Amen. Now, with that in mind, I, what I want you to see is how this same context, I didn't notice this till this morning, that this is the same context as Romans chapter 1. And look with me back at chapter 1 of, of chapter, I mean, verse 1 of chapter 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above. In other words, we talked about that in, in relation to being not conformed to the image of this world, remember, in Romans 12. Not on the things of the earth. Now, verse 13, for ye are what? For ye are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. So we're talking about what? We are dead. That, in other words, we have put off the old man. There is a resurrection mentioned there. We have been resurrected with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the new man. And Christ is living his resurrection life through us. I think it's fascinating. We basically have the same context right here. We put off the old man. We have put on the new man. And now what we need to do is we need to manifest. We need to reflect the character of Jesus Christ. And we need to exhibit the greatness, the essential quality of Christ's life <coughs> character. It is the uniting and it is the controlling factor of all these other virtues mentioned in, in uh, Colossians 2, uh, 3, verse 12 and 13. We need to put on that essential Christ-like character and that essential Christ-like quality of what? Of charity. All right, that is an introduction to Colossians, into 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is what I just gave you right there. That charity is the greatest essential quality of Christ-like character and God wants us to exhibit that great essential quality of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, before we go this morning, I want us to focus on verse 14 and above all these things put on charity and notice this which is the bond of no I'm sorry I already did that back up back up to verse 12 put on therefore as the, as the elect of God holy and beloved and here's what, what I want you to see the next three words here's what I want you to put on put on therefore as the elect of God holy and beloved bowels of mercies I look at that and bowels of mercies. That's not planned to what we're studying. And I looked at I, I studied it and I come up with this conclusion. Bowels of mercies is a heart and a mind so controlled by loving kindness and tenderness. That's tenderness of heart. Now listen, it is a heart and mind so controlled by loving kindness and tenderness that it is compelled by the Christ and the love of Christ. Now listen. 
to give others that which they do not deserve. Can you say that one more time? Yeah. I'm sorry? Can you say that one more time? Can you say that one more time? Please say it again. Yes, yes. yes. Say I'm it so again. sorry. I'm sorry. I need to turn my hearing aids up. Okay. It is a heart and a mind so controlled by loving kindness and tenderness, which, by the way, your heart will be controlled by that if you have this charity love right here, that it is compelled, your heart is compelled by Christ to give others, now listen carefully, to give others that which they do not deserve. Now, he illustrated that for you in verse 13. Notice what he said, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a what? Quarrel against any. Even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And I'll say this before we go. It is, I want you to think about this. Let the Holy Spirit prompt you. Is there any person in your life that has wronged you. Maybe y'all had a quarrel. Or maybe it's a one inside quarrel. And they just have a quarrel against you. You try to be gracious. But they. What's your attitude toward that person? Mm -hmm. Do you have the Christ like, essential Christ like character? This, this absolute quality to where you can honestly. That your heart and your mind is so controlled by the love of Christ and, and the charity love, you're, you're, you're literally compelled to give others that which they do not deserve. And in the context, that's forgiveness. A heart's been burdened for a week or two. Because of someone I've talked about, wonderful, wonderful, but I'm just a wonderful Christian person. But they said, can I talk to you for a minute? And I said, sure. And, and, they, and they told me that they have got bitterness in their heart. They're having a hard time getting bitter. Because of several people that have hurt them. And what I pray. And of course I pray for them at that very moment. And I've been praying for them. It's been a burden on my heart ever since that time. Because folks, I know how destructive unforgiveness can be. I know the bitterness. It grows, festers, and grows more, and putrefies, and brings about corruption. It'll, it'll corrupt your mind, then a crop that, that beautiful, wonderful, tender heart you did have. And it'll separate your fellowship with the Father and this, all this Galatians 2 20 stuff. And it's a long, long way off, distant, that you kind of hear it, but it's just far from you now and you're just not interested. And I've had friends go down the tube, and some of them I feel like never return. And it started with somebody offending them or saying something or hurting them in some way. Folks, the things we're teaching here about this life is the real deal. And it's the difference in a quality of life that you can enjoy and a love that you never dreamed you could have for other people. Great peace have they which love thy word and what? How much do you love the principles of them teaching? If you love it enough and believe it, no unbelief, and apply it, people can beat you to death and say the dirtiest things about you. And of course it's going to hurt. But according to my Bible, if you're in Christ and you're in Christ like character, and we'll get to the definition of offend later, it won't offend you. It won't, it won't hinder your spiritual progress. All right, Father, in Jesus' precious name, we thank you for the rich and wonderful, wonderful truths of the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit apply it to our hearts. Father, we are sensitive now and aware of the, of the service that's coming up, the needs of the service, the kids out back, all that's going on, all the teachers, 
our foe, father, bind and blind the devil. Oh, we'll trust you to bind and blind the devil to bring great, great liberty from the very singing of the first song of the choir. And hey, Brother really Chris, you pull the Holy Ghost, the choir members, those that sing specials. All that are serving in any way, the Father, please bind and blind the devil in the pew. Powerful. May there be a great liberty, great power, a great movement where hearts are changed, and souls are saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, dear folks. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I'm honestly saying thank you for coming. God bless you. Amen, brother. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Wow. Thank you so much. And thank you, my dear brother, for being here. It's a privilege. It always means a lot for you to be here. It really meant a lot this morning. <laughs> It'd have been a little more bare if you two hadn't been here this morning. <laughs> and it does affect the teacher whether you think it does or not. You know what I mean? Uh, last, last week, we were pushing the walls out. Yeah. But I was already telling the Lord this morning, Lord, about circumstances. You taught me how to handle all that. You taught me to use the principles. You taught me how to handle it. I'm not going to get discouraged if, by your grace if you'll help me. I did, so thank God. Love you guys. You too. Yes, sir.